Second, I am John Caney. I am from reInvent Albany. Uh, we're a nonprofit advocacy group located here in New York City that works on uh, state open government and transparency, open data, freedom of information law, uh, government accountability, following the money websites, uh, everything that has to do with uh, government being more transparent and understandable to the public. And we also, uh, here in New York City, work on, um, as part of the Transparency Working Group, uh, work on New York City open data and FOIL. So check out our website, reinventalbany.org. There's pictures like this that show you the kind of stuff that we're working on and projects um, that we do. So what does it mean to be an advocate, just so you know? Who is this guy? What do, they, what do these people do who are advocates? Um, that's a great question. My children still don't know, but I'll tell you. What we do is we work with other groups um, and um, basically petition government. We go to government, we say, hey, please do this thing. And so we do that through letters, um, we do that through face-to-face -face meetings, we do it through public hearings, um, and sometimes we do it um, via the very formal process of getting legislation introduced as a mandate. So um, we work with national groups a lot on freedom of information law, which is very, very important, and, and we'll get into this in a second, and is the underpinning of, um, open data and the whole open data philosophy. Um, there's a letter from us on some topic and you can see it's about getting uh, a whole number of groups and stakeholders and other people to ask for the same thing all at the same time. And that's called pressure or advocacy. And that's how we make change. So our group was one of the uh, key movers behind getting the open data law adopted here in New York City in 2012. And um, subsequently, we've probably been the main watchdog and pusher and bugger um, with city government on that issue. So um, in that role, we've heard lots and lots and lots of praise and lots and lots of um, complaints about the open data law and the city's open data process. Um, today, um, I was hoping that we could have some folks, let's see, everybody, all my pals skipped out on this session here, but we have some folks here, both from government um, and the federal government who worked on the New York City open data law and its implementation. And uh, I wanna call on them actually and ask them a couple questions. Um, my remarks are gonna be as short as I can make them and um, we're gonna have as much discussion and Q&A as possible. There's a ton to talk about when you talk about open data, right? You can talk about um, platforms, the debate over should there be portals and not portals. Um, you have issues, profound policy issues over privacy, you know, uh, how, how, how much is too much when it comes to the public and the kind of information that you're releasing. Um, you have issues of, um, uh, basic governance, inertia, all kinds of things. And I'm gonna to try to touch on them, but if I miss them, let's talk about them. Um, so well, we also put out a lot of policy papers and um, research in this case. Um, there's a session later today called Listening to FOIL. Um, we're the, the big proponents and kind of launched a national movement to use freedom of information law logs, the actual request logs, um, to identify uh, data sets that should be liberated. We think um, freedom of information law and open data go hand in glove, and here's a little report on uh, one city agency, in fact, the city technology agency, analyzing their freedom of information law requests. So um, that's a little tool that we use. We also work on government accountability on public integrity issues too, and issue reports on that, and um, have a, 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 you know, what would you think is a, a more conventional good government role? So we've won a lot of stuff. We're pretty good at being advocates and um, also at nudging things along, especially things that are, are going in the right direction. Um, we, we got city and state to pass laws and executive orders mandating that agencies put out public data. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, the New York State open data portal is actually one of the best. Um, and um, Andrew Nicklin, who was the city's open data uh, coordinator, went to become the state's. Um, and um, one of his uh, interesting philosophies, and I'll just mention this, um, was um, when he was at the city, the city's priority was quantity over quality, putting out lots and lots of data sets fast. At the state, they had a different philosophy, which was quality first. So they've really worked on data quality and um, uh, automatically updating data sets at the state level. And in fact, the New York State Department of Health is considered to be the best in the United States um, among public health agencies. And um, they are frequently, frequently um, cited, or at least their open data is by um, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Associated Press, people like that. 
Um, and that's a big open data success story in New York. And I'll just flag that for a second. You know, a lot of times open data success, it doesn't say this is an open data success story on it. That's not what it says. It says stuff like big disparities in costs over hip replacements. That's a true, that's an open data success story. Um, uh, we, we want some huge updates to the Attorney General's Open Government website, which is called New York Open Government. That's a really cool open data uh, platform mashup. It has campaign finance data, lobbying data, um, uh, and state contracts in one place and one search box. And it's all downloadable and machine readable. And my group spent a lot of time getting that. We think that's kind of the um, on the road to being state of the art public transparency for. Uh, public integrity website, so you could take a look at that. Um, we also um, helped the State Board of Elections, which if anyone here works on campaign finance data, um, knows has serious problems. Um, we helped them uh, get funding for a big upgrade that's underway um, here. And um, we also have a role as um, people that um, have to uh, fight back sometimes. So we were the folks that, um, got Governor Cuomo to reverse his policy of automatically deleting state, uh, the emails of state employees after 90 days. I don't know if anybody here saw that in the papers, but that was a huge fight last year, very tough. And, um, and we also um, work on public uh, funding accountability issues. So um, one of our projects was ending state raids on MTA funding, which may seem a little out of place there, but really what our basic idea is we want government to be fair and accountable and trustworthy. All, you know, great goals and fun to work on. And um, our last, you know, what I wanted to highlight is that um, next week, New York City is launching an open FOIL platform. So all FOIL requests are going through a single platform for all agencies. And um, you probably heard it here first because there's a news embargo on it and I wasn't supposed to talk about it. But, um, but that's gonna be coming next week and you will be able to see every single FOIL request and response to New York City agencies starting with a beta. And um, what's cool about that is we got the city to use uh, Code for America's um, open source uh, code that they use for the city of Oakland called Oakland Record Track and do a modification of that. And it is um, an example of civic shareware and what will be agile development because we got the city to agree to a, a um, agile process and to do a beta of six city agencies first. And we told them it was okay to start with six. They didn't have to roll it out to 82 plus agencies to start with. And this was actually kind of a big thing. They were surprised that um, people like us thought that was okay. Um, anyway, open data. What's open data? Um, I'm gonna define it here as a philosophy and a practice, both. That public data produced by government should be published online by government in an easy to find, download, machine readable form, um, AKA user friendly form. Other people define it in different ways, but that's the one we go with. We think it's understandable. Now, if you look at this, one of the things this really hinges on is public data. What is public data? Good question. Um, one of the big uh, aspects of the New York City open data law was defining what public data is. And basically it says that any data that's releasable under the freedom of, or tabular data, quantitative data, numbers, um, that can be released under the freedom of information law and don't have too many personally identifiable information in them uh, are subject to release under the city's open data law. So that definition right there is really important. The what is public data question is one that bedevils open data all over the world and that um, people are fighting over a lot because that privacy edge, that security edge, you know, what's okay and what's not okay thing is a big, big question. Now I'll say this, in the United States and in New York and in New York City in particular, we are very fortunate to have a well-established legal regime set of case law cases going back 40 years from the freedom of information law that helps answer a lot of those questions. So when the New York City open data law passed, my group was visited by people from many, many countries around the world. And the main thing that they wanted to talk about wasn't the implementation. It wasn't, you know, CCAN versus Socrata versus, um, you know, another platform. It wasn't, you know, what um, should we use Dublin metadata standards? No, it was what is public data and how do you define it? Because they don't have FOI laws that are as defined as we do in New York City. So if you're looking, if you're working globally, internationally at all, 
you know, look for that. This is a big thing. Um, and the, we cheat on it in the open data law, but we don't need to really define it as much as they do elsewhere. So, you know, big grand slam open data stuff from the past um, that kind of set the table for this generation of open data. The open data before it was called open data. You know, profound decision to make weather data free in the United States, right? Powers tons and tons of big companies, media businesses, all kinds of stuff. I don't know if people know this, that I think it was until last year or the year before, Weather data was, uh, was, you had to pay for it. It was license only in Britain, of all places. So there's, oh, when open data is free and it's used for a long time, we forget about it. It's like air. We breathe it, we use it, we don't think about it as open data. But when you start charging for it, it's a different thing. So there was a big fight a big advocacy fight in Britain about licensing weather data, and people were pointing to the US again and again and again uh, over that. And I'm pointing that out to you because there's a ton of information that the New York City government, state, federal government does not make open. And bizarrely enough, a lot of that is codes and laws and regulations. So how many people here work in the kind of open data space for business, um, for government, for, and actively have to pull data? Can you just, let me just see your hands. Not so many. Um, of you folks uh, out there, how many people here have run into fees for trying to get data off of government websites? Okay, a couple people, not so many as I expect. Very often when we go to an open data audience, people, that'll be one of the big things that people ask about. Why do we have, you know, is, is paying for information? So more, more open data. Now big open data, kind of the evolution of open data usage, weather, GPS, transit, right? People here have used bus time or subway time. Um, MTA bus time API was one of the first large scale, heavily used um, APIs in New York City um, and spawned many, many apps here. And this is all before or independent of the open data law, but it's part of the creation of an expectation. So expectations are what drive government, public policy, politics. What does the public expect? And so the open data law and open data that's a codified expectation, a formalized expectation. That's what it is, that's how we think about it. So I'm gonna talk about the New York City open data law because that's what I was asked to talk about, but there's a ton of cool stuff to talk about open data more broadly. And in some ways, open data may have more immediate potential and may grow faster outside of government. Uh, nonprofits, uh, we call it openorg.org, and uh, putting nonprofit data online is an area that is just absolutely screaming out to be, um, to be realized right now because of the enormous amounts of money that nonprofit groups, whether they're service providers, advocates, or whatever, that they gather and that they sit on and they don't share. So there's massive potential right now. Places to look right now are places like Pew, Charitable Trust, who's working now to make more of their data available and opened up. Other areas are academia. I don't know if people know this, but that a lot of the biggest universities have a massive internal uh, open data infrastructure of sorts that we don't get to see right now. So for instance, if you log into Columbia Libraries, um, their open data or internal data availability is linked to Stanford's now and a bunch of other places. Um, and there are a ton of university open data networks that are still cloistered in academia and have not been federated or shared with the broader public right now. And so there's an area right there where there can be huge, huge opportunities. Business, you think that all information is proprietary for businesses and they would never wanna share that or download it, but it's starting to happen right now. And we see examples all the time like City Bike. I bet you some people here today came by City Bike and the data is available via API and people are building apps and looking at it and analyzing and doing all kinds of things for it. Why is City Bike doing that? They're doing it in part for marketing, but in part to unsilo the data for themselves. So um, this is an interesting thing here and I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. I'm talking about this because I want, I, inevitably, um, people are gonna ask what about these other data universes, but also just to establish the context that government open data is only one piece of this massive dataverse that I think everybody knows is out there. So Local Law 11, 2012, the New York City Open Data Law, um, it comes uh, on the heels of uh, the White House Open Data 
uh, executive order in 2009 and New York City Big Apps competitions and um, is um, put into form by Phil Ashlock, who's in back here, who's now the uh, chief architect at data.gov in the federal government, and um, Gail Brewer, who was the head of the city council technology committee. And I think that bill was kind of an outer space concept for most of city council at the time. Um, and, um, and, uh, but, but it was so intuitive that a big group of um, civic groups, including my group, got together behind it and helped uh, push it. And um, interestingly enough, um, the administration under Bloomberg uh, loved it and hated it at the same time. It's the only negotiation I've ever been in where you had advocates in a city agency, in this the city's transportation agency, um, and city council on one side of the table as team, one team, and the other side was the city's law department as the other team. So it was one part of the mayor's office, the city council and advocates versus the law department. And um, we kind of won, and um, we got this great bill out, but we also kind of lost, and I'll get to that in a second, because um, the bill was a little less perfect than we hoped for. Um, what does the law do? Um, really what it does is it importantly defines open data, and data, as anyone here who works with data, a lot of it is about definitions, right? I mean, you have to have metadata that's clear. You have to know what the data is describing. It just can't have a, you know, a giant string of numbers that are not attached or contextualized at all. So definitions are important. Um, that was a big deal. Um, it, it defines open data. It tells agencies to go and look and see what data sets they have and do an inventory and identify the public data sets. That is data that doesn't endanger personal privacy or public security. You know, what's the combination to the, um, you know, mayor's bathroom when he's in it, stuff like that. I don't know what the, you know, dams, uh, important public buildings that bad people might want to damage, things like that. Um, all of that's off limit. Um, ask them to then put that data all online in the open data portal, and it creates an open data portal by 2018, or actually by the end of 2018, so you know the beginning of 2019, and to set a schedule for that. That's basically what it does. It also sets up a technical standards manual because everybody knew that the law was never gonna be precise enough or flexible enough to deal with the everyday issues. And so this bill has a nifty portion for public policy students are here because it delegated to the agency a tremendous, in this case, the city's do it technology agency, a ton of, a ton of flexibility in how to implement the law. And part of that was because um, they supported the law and therefore advocates and city council trusted them as wanting to do the right thing. So this bill's technical standards manual is actually where the guts of it are. So if you're studying this bill or writing about it, look at the technical standards manual, which is as important as the, the bill itself. And that's where the um, data standards, metadata standards, definitions, stuff like that are all laid out. So we think that's a pretty, a pretty nifty model. Now, what the bill doesn't have is an enforcement mechanism. Um, and we couldn't win that, and the law department would not allow what's called a private right of action, which is the right of the public to sue, to go to court, to make an agency comply with the law. Usually in New York City, it's through an Article 78 civil procedure. Um, and um, the law department was adamant that, no, we're not gonna let you have a private right of action. And then, you know, from their perspective, they're right, because by now we would have sued the city over and over and over again. So, you know, uh, good foresight by them. Um, unfortunately, that left us with the option of only name and shame and city council hearings to really put pressure on the, um, on the agencies to comply with the bill. Now, I'm gonna go um, on with this in just a second here, but this is a actually pretty important point. One of the biggest, you heard me earlier jumping up and down and saying, you know, this is revolutionary, this is a huge change in the nature of government and governance, and it is, but it only is if there's an enforcement mechanism or political process through which the public will can be imposed or that mandate can be enforced. And in the absence of that, it's aspirational, okay? So we're somewhere between aspirational and revolutionary right now, to use words ending in Y. Um, so huge success, yeah, I think so. I think this bill has been a huge success. Um, you know, 1,400 plus data sets, I think they're up to like 150 data sets that are um, 
uh, uh, automated right now. The city has a full-time team, paid team of five people that automate data and that take it from agencies and upload it to the open data portal. Um, they've got, um, and once you create a bureaucracy of people whose job it is to do that, they just grind forward and they overcome obstacles. And it's very impressive the things that they can do. Um, but what we haven't done yet is gotten to that place of takeoff, of really making this cool, of connecting the dots. So, um, so good stuff. This is gonna be good stuff and then bad stuff and then how do we fix the bad stuff, all right? So um, good stuff, robust open data culture. You're all here, you all think it's cool. Um, we've got businesses that are using uh, the open data portal as part of their business model. Um, we've got, um, especially in the real estate industry where you have uh, websites that you guys might even been to, like um, Property Shark or um, uh, Site Comply, that sells um, business uh, that tells businesses when they're going to get a violation from the Department of Building, so they can fix it in advance. How about that? So another, so the city is posting uh, violations on the Open Data Portal before it is actually giving them to the people getting the um, violation. So somebody made a business out of that. Um, we've got a Department of uh, Telecommunications do it that has a lot of people that are interested in open data and kind of get the value proposition of open data and are doing a lot of stuff. The open data portal is one thing. They've got a developer portal, New York City Big Apps, which is promotion, a 311 open API, and 311 is the big enchilada of open data at the municipal level, right? Every, there's 1,400 data sets, but you know, if you put them on a scale, 1400 would be three, you know, 1399 would be here and 311 would be here and it would be about the same because 311 is what really tells us about government service delivery and what the public is asking about. And 311 is expanding every year. The amount of channels that you can report your problems or questions through via 311 keeps getting more and more and more and it gets easier and easier. And 311 is getting more and more descriptive, more and more granular. So the data is getting more and more useful. So 311, if you're a student of this area, it is the bomb. It's the big thing here, right? So. Having an API and having people who manage the 311 system that get that is very, very important. Now, just a second, a, a moment here on, three, on open data opportunities, the value proposition here. There's a ton of them, and if I don't reel one of these off, then you know, hit me from the audience. Um, you've got accountability, oversight, and fairness. You know, public actually being able to see what government is doing, everything from service delivery to statistics on healthcare is provided to granting and spending activity to all kinds of things. So it's a fundamental accountability measure, um, very popular with groups like ours. You've got innovation, deliver government services better, um, things like transit apps, right? Um, all kinds of uh, opportunities. Um, we saw Jen Polka with making uh, forms simpler and um, creating apps for, you know, using whatever APIs are, are out there for different services. Um, you have innovation services to businesses. I mentioned Site Comply and Property Shark, but there's other businesses too that use open data. Uh, insurance companies are big, big consumers of government data, for instance. So there's a direct, I can make money from this um, economic development thing. Um, reduce cost to government. Uh, in from, uh, by um, identifying, uh, you know, opportunities to provide services more efficiently. You know, maybe we have too many, uh, too many garbage pickups in one area and not enough in another area. So um, that's, you know, we're scratching the service, but it's public analytics. Um, maximizing uh, the, um, the public value of the data. So important things to, to think about here is that open data, um, by the estimates that we've seen and the best studies we've seen is somewhere around one-tenth of one percent of a data set's total cost is opening it to the public, okay? It is infinitesimal because it is so bloody expensive to have human beings collecting that data. So until we get into the internet of things and, and your toaster's reporting to the government how much energy it's using and how much toast you burn this morning, 
It's gonna be about humans and humans who work in government, calling other people up, doing surveys, doing physical surveys, collecting, laboriously collecting data, right? And that's really how it works. So the cost of putting data out there is teeny tiny compared to the cost of creating that data. And this is really important because there is a huge pushback and argument against open data based on cost, which you may scoff at, but I'm in those meetings and I can tell you it's brought up again and again and again. Why are we doing this? This is a waste of time and money. And of course our answer is because this will save you money, this will help you be more efficient, this will help you understand what you're doing. But back to the big opportunities and the value propositions. So maximizing the use of data, getting the most value from the data is intrinsically useful, okay? Businesses, journalists, the public, and other government agencies. Everyone benefits when it's easier to get the data with less friction and less cost. And that means licensing requirements, that means paywalls, that means fees, all that stuff. And we think one of the biggest value propositions is actually government to government. That is reducing the cost of government agencies retrieving data about other government agencies or their own agency. And I'll tell you a story. We, were, we did a, um, a big training meeting with state employees in Albany, New York, uh, a couple of years ago, and we did a survey and we asked 200 people in the audience who work for the state of New York, have you ever foiled, filed a freedom of information law request towards another state agency? And 12 people raised their hands. And afterwards, five people came up to me and said, I know this was webcast and I didn't want to raise my hand, but I did too. So that brought us up to 17 out of about 200 people who had foiled other agencies. And then I asked jokingly, ha ha, how many of you have foiled your own agency? Three people told me they had foiled their own agency for information because they couldn't get the information from another bureau or division of their agency. This is a true story. I will swear to it, okay? So, is government information hard to get for people in government? Heck yeah, it is. If you work in government, what's the first thing you do when you want information that's outside your normal channel? What do you think it is? You go online, you search for it, like everybody else, right? So unsiloing data and making it very easy to find via open data is potentially hugely valuable for government. And I actually believe that's who ultimately will benefit the most from it. Um, though that's less exciting to everybody. So. Anyway, so value proposition. Did I miss something? Phil, anybody else? Like open data, the basic value propositions. Nothing. Okay, we'll assume that we got most of them. So robust open data culture in New York. I think everybody here knows there's cool stuff going on. Um, we have the big apps competitions, which I view mainly as cultural enforcement and creating a vehicle for activity and community and getting people excited and showing the value of open data and potential value. Now we really haven't had big apps that have caught on fire and had changed everyday life for New Yorkers so much. But what we have had is lots and lots of interesting good ideas coming out. And I think the longer we do big apps, the more likely it is, the more apt it is, we'll have an app that is a big thing. So I, I, you know, we hope that they keep going on. Um, MTA developer community. Is anybody here on the MTA developer community list? Not one person, interesting, okay. One person is. Two people, okay. Um, this is a great thing. It's a, a Google group that the MTA started a long time ago. Maybe it's getting long in the tooth, but um, it's a place where actual humans who know things from the MTA talk to the developers and try to troubleshoot problems with data. Um, and it's something the city of New York is not doing right now, but uh, a, another big government agency in New York is doing right now. So, you know, here's some transit apps and things like that we were just talking about, um, things that things that you can do with open data to build apps and to do things. Um, and just out of curiosity, who here is building apps right now based on New York City open data? Just getting a sense of the audience. Okay, a fair number of people are. Um, so robust open data culture, people like me who think it's really great, but not just me, a lot of people at the community board level, um, city council members actually know what the term open data means. It's created this new expectation. So it's a so social, cultural, political movement, very, very successful, very successful, given how short a time that's been around. Now we get to problems. What's not great here? What is not great? What's not great here is that the actual data on the open data portal has lots of problems. 
tons and tons and tons of problems. So when we look at the open data system, what we look at is data availability. Can you get the data set you want? Is it online? Is it published? Can you find it? That's a big question. Um, and data quality. Is the data that you found good? Is it good data? Are there tons of errors in it? You know, when you look at the geospatial field, is it terrible? Or is, you know, are there potholes in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that need to be filled on 311? You know, are there, are there bizarro results of all kinds? Are there many duplications? And the answer is a lot of problems. And one of the ideas behind um, open data, and I'm going to get ahead of myself here, is that we, the public, are supposed to be like mollusks. We're supposed to be filters. We're supposed to be breathing in the data and exhaling clean data. We're putting in the time to find mistakes, and we want to tell government, hey, guess what? This doesn't look right to me. So, for instance, how is it possible that one month there were hundreds and hundreds of complaints about parking meters in a community board, and the next month there were zero? Everything was fixed in a month, or did you stop reporting that? Which is it? How do we tell that to 311 when we find out? Well, we wanted to know, so we called 311 on the phone. How many people here have used 311 and know what it is? Just out of curiosity, just to make sure. Most people here know what it is. 311 doesn't know how to take a complaint about 311. Okay? So we don't know how, and we do this as our job, how to report problems with data to the city government. And this is the number one complaint that we get as advocates for better open data in the city. And you start thinking about it for a, a moment, and this is a pretty profound problem. You've spent all this time finding this data set, you're invested in doing something useful with it, and you look at the data and it's bad. And so you clean it, you dedupe it, you normalize the geospatial field, you do whatever you need to do to feel better about it, but you're still not sure if it's that good. Because when you got it, it was so bad, so why are you confident that it was even reported correctly? You probably have questions about it. Who do you talk to? Well, right now you talk to nobody. You see, there is no way that you can talk to the city. And this is a big showstopper for a lot of innovation and for a lot of people who want to use this data because they don't have confidence after they get a good look at the data that it's worth anything to them. The other bad part about it is that the government is wasting the opportunity to have the public provide them with free consulting, yeah. right? Here you have all these people that are telling you what's wrong. You don't, for free. And so this is a, a big problem that we flag over and over and over again, and we think that is really holding back the open data um, process in New York. Now, why is it like this? I'll tell, you, but I'll tell you why it's like this. Because most city agencies do not get open data yet. So I gave this glowing, you know, open data culture's here, it's rocking, let's all go home and drink beer, right? It ain't rocking because the people who make the decisions about resources and control the actual data do not get it yet. So there's people in the Department of uh, Technology, in the mayor's office, in the city council, they get it, they wanna, they wanna do great things with it, but people at the city agency level are not getting it yet. They're not seeing how it helps their day-to-day -day job and managers are not seeing how it helps them fulfill their agency mission yet. So right now they look at it as just basically a pain in their butts that they have to comply with. And there's a lot of foot dragging and a lot of, um, a lot of unnecessary problems and friction as a result. So one of the challenges to us, civic society, people who wanna use this data for business is to convince agencies that they should be using the data. And so far, the only thing we've had to offer them is a political hammer on their heads in the form of additional mandates from the city council, which is really not the best way to go. So we're gonna to get to questions in a second here, but you've probably seen slides like this before. If you haven't, here's one for you. It's just a, a little spectrum of green, yellow, and red. And we like to divide up data into green, yellow, and red buckets. Green is the easy stuff, yellow is the nah, I'm not so sure stuff, and red is the no way stuff. So we call them the three bucket test when we're looking at data. Um, the, right now, we've been working on green buckets. Let's get all the green bucket data out there as fast as we can. So stuff having to deal with public infrastructure is green bucket stuff. And you've noticed that if you ever read about open data, like you go on Wikipedia or whatever, or you hear people like me talking about it, we talk about stuff like 
weather, GPS, transit, huh, potholes. What is that? Those are descriptions of the physical universe, not of humans, right? The more you get towards humans and how they behave and things that are involving them, the more tricky things get. So the big successes in open data have all been about data that describes the world, the physical world. And where we are now, still in New York City, is really exploiting green bucket stuff and 311 stuff. Um, soon we will be encountering more yellow stuff, and when we do that, then we're gonna have to spend more time wrangling about privacy issues. Um, what do we think is happening right now in New York City, and what do we think needs to change? So, a couple things before I get to that. Let's go back to green, yellow, and red buckets. Let's go to recommendations. Um, what we think is happening right now, well, first of all, a couple things from working on this open data stuff that you all might find interesting. One of the biggest surprises with the open data law, if not the biggest surprise that we had, was that there were so few people who we, you would call domain experts, to be in jargon world, you know, people have expertise in a particular policy area, who were screaming and yelling with enthusiasm about open data. There was a big yawn. We thought that people would be very excited, you know. Wow, this is so cool, this mandate, all this data is gonna be rolling out there. I'm somebody that works on you know, traffic safety and I'm pretty excited because we'll be able to see traffic crash maps you know, that are better. I'm, I'm saying that because I, I did traffic crash map in like 2000 before we knew what open data was. Um, but the, um, or you know, people with expertise in police, policing, police stuff that they would be really excited about the open data law. It didn't happen that way, and it still hadn't happened that way. And so we were really puzzled about that. Why is that? Why are these jerks not, jerks, oops, sorry. Why are these people not more excited about this? Because the reality is, is that there's a handful of civic technologists and open and data, data enthusiasts as a tribe. And there's tons and tons and tons and thousands and thousands of people who work on housing or transportation or policing or poverty policy in this city. So why weren't we hearing their voice on that? I bet you people here know. I didn't know this. Because they're already getting the data that they want. Because there's this whole, whole world of what we call trusted users. They already have special relationships, either personal relationships with agencies that gets them the data they want, or they're part of think tanks, academic institutions, or advocacy groups that are under contract to the city or to other, and have a relationship that they can get data as long as they don't talk about it. Very, very common, non-disclosure agreements. Very common with policing data, extremely common. We didn't know this until very recently. So the domain experts have been getting the, in, the data that they want for a really long time. So there's tons of voices. In fact, I would say most of the voices in the big data consumers already got what they want. And we call this the tale of two data cities. And the tale of two data cities has two parts to it. One part is about the trusted users, or we call them the trusted or the privileged users, who really don't care that much about open data because it doesn't help them. It may even disadvantage them because there's more competition, right? If you're that one person who got that great data set from the cops and you can write endless papers based on it, that's a career for you. And that data gets posted and every, every kid who's getting a PhD at John Jay College can go out and write their own interpretation of that data. Whoa, there's a lot of that going on in New York City right now. So a lot of dogs did not bark when the open data law was passed. And, um, and we're just learning about it. The second part, the other big surprise, is how much data the city of New York already gathers internally, and, and it was more than we even thought, and then does not share. So the city of New York has a open data, I'm gonna call it an internal open data platform that's called DataBridge, and it costs them roughly, I think, $10 million to build. I think a big aerospace contractor built it, or, uh, Pardon me, I think it was Deloitte that built it. But it's a big platform, much bigger, much more sophisticated than the city's Socrata open data platform. And DataBridge is what the mayor's office uses to look at data. 
It's their data mashup platform. It's their open data platform. And it also has a geospatial uh, normalizer, coder, um, parser on it that allows them to fix all of those location problems I was talking about with 311 data and to make sure that when you compare 311 to 911 to all of that data, that it all makes sense to you, okay? So they have that internally. Now, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up in one minute. Now, this is kind of crazy, but there are three data sets for every data set in New York City. There's an agency data set, there's the data set on the open data portal, and there's the data bridge data set. So what the hell, all right? You can think about that for a second. Um, so we have a ton of recommendations here about how to change things. And um, they're over there, and I can't see them. They're too far away from me. Oh, they're right in front of me. But a lot of them have to do with appointing full-time open data director and deputy director within the mayor's office somewhere which does not exist right now. So currently we have um, people working on data automation and actual mechanics of implementing the data, open data law, but we have no management brains. The people who do that are uh, data analysts at Moda. Lindsay was here earlier, and they have, they're like the fire brigade of data. So New York City has this problem in that we're not putting in place simple systems to deal with all these problems I just described here. Um, the, um, the other big thing that we need, want to recommend is that the city spend more on open data. We think it has huge economic development potential, and we would compare it to this. Right now, the city is spending $20 million a year subsidizing three ferry routes across the East River. That's $20 million a year, all told for just ferry service, okay? The city has about a $70 billion annual budget. All told, on open data, the city's probably spending between one and two million dollars a year right now. So to really achieve scale in a city of 8.3 million people, you have to do stuff. You have to fix data quality. You have to have human beings that can talk to other human beings. You have to be able to do all of those things like that. So, it's, so that's our, our big next step is saying you need more people at City Hall and you need more people to deal with the public to fix stuff and to come up with systems or this revolution is going to fizzle and people are going to get frustrated and this is just not going to reach its potential. So we're, right now we're in this, this place where we need to jump to the next step. Anyway, um, I had no one checking my time and I'm sorry. Uh, what's that? I'm just out of time, leaving zero time for Q&A. Um, and I apologize for that because I was hoping to, um, to talk to everyone and I'm getting booted off the stage. But I will be happy to chat with you over here and I'm hoping we can rope in some of the government folks that are here from the mayor's office as well. So thank you so much for your time.